Thank you very much, Benoit. And we'll have uh, Zoe and Jordan, who are uh, right behind the, uh, right in the center of the image here, uh, give our short presentation. So uh, ladies, take it away. Oh, we need to share our screen. So let's get down to the bottom here to share a screen. That would be this one. Uh, share. And now go to presentation. Come on. There we are. Are you seeing uh, U4 Summer School Day 2? Yes, we are. You're all set to go. Okay. Thank you. Take okay. it away. Okay, awesome. Uh, so without further ado, this is uh, how we spent our morning. Uh, I'm Jordan and this is Zoe. Um, we spent our morning with Crispin Wood, the superintendent of urban forestry here in HRM and James Steenberg, a member of the Department of Lands and Forestry um, here. And we talked about uh, different strategies to add to canopy cover. Have you got enough volume uh, folks? Yeah, is this good? Yeah, I can hear awesome. you very well. So uh, we looked at some different ways to add urban canopy cover, uh, specifically street trees and uh, naturalization and deforestation of unused green spaces, uh, especially sort of beside highways. Um, yeah, so. Awesome. So we prioritized these, um, or these two were prioritized um, because in terms of private property trees, um, that is an opportunity, but with our limited um, resources, we want to target the trees that we can protect uh, the most. And usually um, in terms of development, the private property trees are the first to go and have um, no protection. And also in the HRM, 18% of HRM land is road right of way. This, in the peninsula. In the peninsula. This includes the uh, roads. So this has a lot of opportunities uh, for the urban forest in terms of um, noise buffering and uh, absorbing particulates um, and also just where we can put trees. It's where the public is um, and it's a good opportunity. Um, the urban forester Crispin mentioned a lot that it's in um, his paradigm to invest in the trees that we have and make sure the trees that we're putting in the ground um, do not die um, rather than just planting as many trees as possible. Uh, kind of what Amory said, um, in terms of uh, just putting the most trees in the ground isn't always um, as effective in terms of how should we add to the canopy rather than just adding to the canopy in itself. Uh, yeah, so Crispin uh, also talked a fair bit about how uh, one of the areas of largest impact uh, to increase canopy cover would be to uh, change the design and imp implementation standards uh, for building, uh, especially like uh, when roads are redone uh, or sidewalks are redone, uh, because our current standards for tree lawns um, here in HRM, the standard tree lawn width is uh, 1.5 uh, meters, uh, including the curb, which makes it about 1.2 meters. Um, and uh, when you look at older uh, neighborhoods, uh, we've got great big trees in one uh, that could, e could be even smaller than that, but they managed to get to that size because the uh, sidewalk construction was different. Uh, the uh, soil underneath the sidewalk was not compressed nearly as much. And so the trees roots can go underneath and they have access to a lot more soil and water. Um, so with our modern uh, sidewalk construction practices, uh, this tree lawn with, is not wide enough for trees to survive and grow to maturity. Um, so this is definitely a, a big area for improvement. Um, yeah. So uh, some ways that Crispin has tackled this um, with the, our limited budget and resources um, have been uh, sidewalk bridges. So primarily um, the way the sidewalk is constructed, there's rebar going through the uh, concrete, um, but to allow more uh, fill to be put down underneath the sidewalk, um, certain um, blocks of it do not have this rebar and are just kind of bridged between them um, so that more roots can penetrate underneath the sidewalk in itself. Um, this is a cheaper solution. Um, so it's been really effective for Crispin. 
And of course there are soil cells, which have uh, been shown to be super effective and a good solution. They are really expensive. The photo on the right is uh, Argyle Street, which was um, colored Argyle one year, which is great. Um, this was a redesign that was implemented and um, the soil cells have been quite successful here. Um, so um, that has been a good solution. But the tree boxes have not. Right. The tree boxes that we see in the picture yeah. that are black, they're not successful. But the soil cells are in successful. other parts of Argyle are mm -hmm. successful. Yeah. I see. yeah. Um, yeah, so it's kind of important for uh, to Crispin to advocate for increased budgets from the issues that counselors care about. So, for example, if we want to look at equity and how important that is, um, well, a good way um, to increase the tree canopy in those areas would be to actually implement changes in design uh, and strategies so that the tree lawns can be sufficient for more trees to grow. Um, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so um, another big thing is uh, what the public thinks of the trees, because um, uh, Crispin wants to focus on uh, planting trees that will grow and thrive and reach maturity, um, because, um, I mean, uh, mostly for the, all the benefits of increased canopy cover, but also because uh, dead trees, uh, when we plant trees and they just don't make it, uh, they don't look good. Um, and that decreases um, people's uh, trust in the uh, municipality to plant trees well, and they aren't as eager to uh, ask for more trees to be planted. Um, so yeah, um, I think uh, education and public outreach are super important. Um, and um, Kristen was saying that um, economic evaluations uh, like the iTree uh, cost benefit um, analyses don't actually um, figure into uh, his uh, operations as much because um, they're not as effective in changing public perception as uh, perhaps studies and infographics that show how planting trees directly affect people with um, health benefits and aesthetic benefits. Um, it's, it's nice to have trees on the street um, when, they're, when they're beautiful. Um, so that's uh, what was something interesting to learn because um, I've, I've read a lot of papers that uh, talk a lot about the economic uh, cost benefit analyses. Um, of planting trees. Um, yeah, so um, the other thing is um, often research uh, gets done and then it does, um, Crispin doesn't actually use it. Um, and so he was saying that uh, we need to look at, we need to target our research projects for the, to, to the subjects that uh, uh, will actually help uh, the people doing the work um, and, and get things done, basically. Um, yeah. All right, so next up, once we left the streets and um, stopped examining those, we came to some unused green spaces uh, with uh, some ongoing naturalization projects um, that James Steenberg uh, spearheaded here. So what you're looking at is a naturalization project that occurred in an exchange um, a heavily trafficked area in the north end of Halifax. Um, this is right next to the bridge. So it was done in partnership with uh, Bridge Patrol. And um, it has been uh, largely a subject of experimentation, but as well as um, an opportunity to increase canopy cover as no one is using these spaces for anything um, like having lunches or anything recreational. And it's gonna be a little hard pressed for natural regeneration to get here. And there's also a ton of Norway maples nearby. So we don't necessarily want those to be um, coming in either. So we had a planting of uh, native species and we have been examining how those have been doing. Um, so the first order of business here in this naturalization was uh, to get the city to stop mowing. And um, our prioritization of native trees um, helped aid in the biodiversity. As you can tell in the um, picture on the right, we found this cool spider living here. 
I forget what it was called. An orb weaver, a weaver of some kind. Yeah, um, so that was quite interesting. You could hear the insects um, buzzing around, which was nice. Um, so we planted red maple, uh, large white pines. Mostly the uh, conifers did well that we found. Um, the non-conifers um, did not fare as well, such as the red maple and the yellow birch. Um, overall, um, this has been kind of a successful, I would say, um, naturalization project or a way to bridge that gap in canopy um, in a useful way. Yeah, so um, the research side of this uh, was, uh, if you look closely at the picture on the left, you can see uh, that there's quite a difference in the vegetation on the right side of the picture and on the left side of the picture. Uh, there's a lot more just plain grass on the right and a lot uh, more sort of herbaceous uh, shrubs on the left. Um, and among the shrubs on the left, there's a lot, also a lot uh, taller um, softwoods, especially that were planted. Uh, so there were four treatments uh, done uh, in the sort of four quadrants of this picture, um, on the, the left and the right, uh, on the far and to what's closer to us in that photo. Um, so the uh, closest to the right uh, was our was the control. Uh, the farther to the right uh, was uh, just uh, seedlings planted uh, with like a little strip of uh, soil uh, around them and uh, with compost. Uh, closest to the left uh, was tilled um, with the, the sod taken off and also uh, just with the sod taken off. And then farthest to the left was with the sod taken off and um, biosolids added to it. Um, and so it's been, this was started in the summer of 2017. So it's been five growing seasons. Uh, and you can see that the farthest patch to the left uh, is growing the most. Um, and what's interesting was uh, this was done to look at competition uh, control or, or to control for competition. And um, uh, it's um, on the, the farthest to the left patch, uh, it um, helped all <laughs> um, the soft, the, the trees that were planted are growing a lot better, but also all of the other uh, brush is also growing better. Uh, but it did give the trees uh, a good head start so that they're sort of just above their competition. Uh, and I think uh, we haven't done any analysis on it, uh, but uh, it's, that seems to have done to have worked really well. Um, so yeah, it was a really interesting uh, experiment. What's actually kind of cool is uh, if you look at the picture on the right, um, that little clump of herbaceous uh, vegetation is where a dump of biosolids went. So you can really see that it makes a makes a difference. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. So our main issue or our main question after this was, could this be implemented around the city? How impactful would these additions be um, to canopy cover? Um, so we traveled to another area in the north end, Seaview Lookoff Park, uh, which actually is a decommissioned ball diamond. Um, the picture on the right, we're standing in the ball diamond now um, in it. And it has been super effective. The trees um, that are just behind uh, the four of us in the right picture are all of the trees that were planted, a ton of conifers, um, white pines and red pines. Um, it was super successful. They were planted one meter apart and almost like the mortality rate is very, very low. Um, and on the left, this uh, was a planting near the park um, on a residential street um, right next to a very uh, loud and busy highway. And these trees have also performed very well. Uh, so overall, um, I believe in our city, there are like enough spaces that this is definitely a viable um, route. And even, even if there weren't any addition to canopy in a, meaning, in a meaningful way is good. Um, 
And these trees have certainly been um, successful and haven't um, harmed any major um, public perception issues, hasn't, haven't gotten in anybody's way, and uh, the public seems to yeah, enjoy it. Uh, so in conclusion, um, we've got a lovely picture here. Um, and so our main two points are that uh, we aren't looking just at how to increase uh, canopy cover, but also what are the best ways to increase canopy cover? Um, you know, planting a lot of trees with the high, possibly potentially a high mortality rate, or focusing our efforts on planting less trees, um, but putting them in places uh, where they will do well uh, and increase to increase the quality of the canopy cover. Uh, and then also there are um, lots of barriers and challenges uh, to increasing canopy cover. Um, but that also just means that there is lots of room to improve uh, and uh, uh, explore. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Thank you. And uh, if I could just add one, uh, two words to the presentation uh, concept, I think I knew about before, but hadn't really um, heard articulated so well as this morning by Crispin. He is really concerned as the chief of urban forestry in the concept of asset reputation. And he figures that um, the, 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 the ongoing health of his department and therefore the ongoing health of the urban forest with a good, uh, with a healthy department and budget to look after them is, is largely dependent on having a very positive asset reputation. Street trees are in people's faces because that's where we spend so much of our time uh, when we're outside of our houses. And he desperately wants there to be no dead trees in the street. And he can't get that very easily because of the age of our um, canopy. We're having some struggles with the survival rates of trees as we know from the data we've been collecting, but uh, he is desperate to make sure that every tree that's in the street uh, becomes a healthy tree. And if it doesn't, that we get it off the, uh, out of the ecosystem as fast as possible, because there's nothing worse than a counselor calling up Crispin and saying, my constituents are complaining about dead trees in the street. So this concept of asset reputation is one I need to uh, understand better. Okay, let's uh, not share the screen anymore. Let's unshare wherever that is. There we go. Okay. We can open the floor for uh, questions from folks from elsewhere in Canada. Yeah, Matt. Go ahead, Matt. Thank you. Uh, interesting to see, and uh, and interesting to see the the uh, push for some natural regeneration uh, as a as a uh, way to to get some canopy cover. I have a, a, a question, and it's not really a critique of of that, but whether or not we'll see some pushback from public. Uh, specifically, I'm thinking about ticks uh, and increase in Lyme disease. Certainly here in uh, in Montreal, it's an issue. Um, and whether or not we'll see some public pushback on these long grass areas <clears throat> in that transition phase um, and how we can manage that and you know hopefully uh, keep it rolling forward without without big public pushback and wondering if that's on anybody's mind um, as we you know push for for natural regeneration type type model that's a good question and I certainly think that it is on the public's mind, or at least it is an issue here. Um, I think that um, is why we target um, areas of low uh, public traffic, such as a decommissioned ball diamond or an exchange where there's a busy road connection and um, individuals won't really be using it for recreation. I think the recreational areas should be target or are being targeted last for these um, regeneration um, structures. I'm not sure what Peter had to add. No, that's true. The uh, if we did this in public parks, busy public parks, then we could well get some uh, negative reaction. However, Matt, 
Um, we've been living with ticks now in Nova Scotia for at least 20, maybe 30 years. Uh, and at least in the southern half of the province, um, folks are pretty comfortable with the, with the tick problem. Not, not, that they're kind of, not that they like it, but they've learned to live with it. And that's going to emerge stronger and stronger here in Halifax and up to the east end of the province as the wave of ticks uh, moves in, in that direction. Just to, just to add something, we, we wandered in some tall grass areas today as well and just sort of routinely went through the team to remind everybody to do a tick check when we got home. And I think that it just comes with the territory of high deer uh, populations. And as people get used to it, it just becomes one of those risks that, that happens and that you have to deal with. Yeah, and I just wanted to add that in some parks uh, in Montreal, they started the uh, differentiate management. So they let some area of parks, they don't uh, mow anymore the lawns. So it's kind of a sort of natural regeneration. Um, and then because the park sometimes are elevated, so it's like the slope, like the, the side of the park, they can be mowed because it's hard with the, you know, the machines and everything. So they let it, and I think there's a pretty good uh, acceptance by the people. I mean, it's in the art of the city. It's not, uh, so I think uh, minds are changing <laughs> towards more acceptance, I hope. <laughs> Any uh, other questions or comments for the uh, Halifax folks? I, I have a question. I can jump in. I, I don't think you guys are going to necessarily solve this issue because I think it's some, one that foresters across the country are, are facing. But since you brought up this issue of space for street trees along the curb, and I think when you say the tree lawn, you mean this a, a grassy strip between the road and the... I don't think, well, to me, I've, I've heard it, in, I've, I've learned it in English as the curb, but I'm, maybe I'm wrong. And that may be like a, a bit of urban forester lingo that, 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 that is not totally harmonized, but uh, you had the strip, there is some space, there is the road that has also irreducible space. The sidewalk had, for accessibility reason clearly has to accommodate wheelchairs uh, as well as maybe bicycles because I didn't see a bike lanes. There's not a lot of room left. So how there's not enough room for the tree. Are we, should we maybe be putting smaller trees or is there some hope that we can sort of eat into the road area? I don't see it happening on the private land area. So did, did Crispin have any sort of insights there? So yeah, that is a large issue facing us um, currently, uh, especially active transportation, such as bus lanes and bike lanes, they're being implemented and the tree lawn is being sacrificed. And uh, yeah, by tree lawn, we mean like the grassy uh, strip between the sidewalk and the curb. Um, when we had in our presentation, the design standards are a 1.5 meter tree lawn. That is the city, including the actual width of the curb itself, um, even though that's not lawn um, so it's more like 1.2 even um, so smaller trees are a viable kind of option we have been planting some columnar like varieties um, but there are other options I think to be explored in maybe having one side of the road have no tree lawn and the other side of the road having maybe a larger tree lawn or space for that um, yeah, I think that's what we're currently facing. And I don't know if you're right. so, does that mean that like houses on one side of the street would be would be worth more money? Oh, I, I you question. know, ultimately it could look that way, uh, but it'd be better to have a tree lawn. If the engineering standards for the roadway won't change, it'd be better to have trees able to live on one side than unhealthy trees on both sides of the road. And so. Um, but the uh, key issue we talked a lot about was compaction. And 40 uh, years ago and 50 years ago and earlier, uh, we did not have such um, tremendous compaction of the surface of the roadway underneath the asphalt and the surface of the ground underneath the uh, concrete of the sidewalk. Today, mm -hmm. we have 
in very intense compaction. In fact, compaction so hard, you can't drive a shovel into it from above, and I've tried, and tree roots cannot penetrate. And so the only place the tree roots can go is along this meter and a half strip. Um, and so if that's going to be the case, what Crispin has insisted on is having a V-shaped um, uh, excavation made in, uh, right down that entire uh, one and a half meter strip loaded with proper soil. And so that way the trees have half a chance to get their roots started. And once the tree becomes bigger, uh, then perhaps it can push its roots through this co heavily compacted uh, territory. But we are also uh, scratching our heads, trying to figure out ways to convince the engineers uh, to design the roadscape with a two and a half meter uh, verge or a tree lawn rather than, and in many places in, in uh, the entirety of Halifax, we have 80 centimeters. Mm -hmm. uh, it's totally ridiculous as a place to try to grow a tree. So I was wondering, looking at the picture, I don't know what, what the conditions are, are like in Halifax, but is there a case to be made for making room for like snow removal in the winter, for instance, where you could, put, you could that, that manages a space where you, where you can just sort of push more snow rather than eating into the road, for instance? I don't know, or maybe it's the opposite. Yeah, snow removal is an issue. As it turns out, it's becoming less of an issue <laughs> with climate change, of course, yeah. but um, there's also the uh, territory in which you need to put signs and um, the city will not allow signs to go on the house, house side of the sidewalk. They have to go between the sidewalk and the curb. So that has to be there. Uh, then we have the power lines. They have to have a place to go uh, with their poles and all the rest. So um, if we could solve the street design issues, most of our tree growing issues would go away. That's a pretty cool I challenge. Just, I, I, I wonder, and Peter, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but um, the, the silicell side of things, or the soil cell uh, issues, um, one of the things that we're, we're dealing with actually in Halifax at one point in time is, is being able to get them under the roadway. And for those of you that aren't familiar, the, the, the soil cells are basically an engineered structure that goes underneath, the, underneath a, a hard surface and allows for, for a, a growing medium. The issue is that you can't put them underneath um, heavy traffic or stopping traffic because their design is vertical load and, and they won't take a, a heavy truck or, or a bus stopping. And I think that's a, a push we need to work with the engineers and say, hey, listen, we need to modify these things so that they can go under the road. And then we can open up that, that huge area to soil cell. I mean, the, the, the technology is there, we just need to push the engineers to, to allow us to kind of push it a little bit further, I think. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Matt, but uh, budgets aren't strong enough that we could use soil cells for every one of the few thousand trees we put in the streets every year. It's, it's, it's demand, supply and demand, right? So we just need to uh, increase the demand, increase the supply, the price will come down and uh, it'll all work out. <laughs> Point. Should we uh, potentially move on, uh, Benoit? Yes, I think uh, we can move on to Montreal, I think is the next city to the west of Halifax. Who has the honor today from Montreal? Yep, it's going to be me, uh, Julian, and uh, Sarah as well. Perfect. So the floor is yours, uh, Julien and Sarah. All right, so uh, in Montreal, we actually went to uh, the city of Laval this morning uh, to first meet with uh, Daniel Boyer, which is the principal forest engineer uh, for the city. And so uh, we visited three different sites. So I'll talk to you about the first one and then Sarah will talk to, to you about the, the two last, the last two. So the first one that we, uh, we visited uh, is this site here uh, outlined in red. So this picture is not to date, but I'll discuss the history of this site a little bit. So it was uh, previously occupied by uh, warehouses uh, with very little trees by the road. Uh, in this picture, all the, uh, the buildings were uh, destroyed uh, to make room for the new project. But uh, there were mostly uh, only trees on, on the side of the railway that we see over here, uh, nothing else. And so the city, uh, 
took this uh, this site and decided to uh, to do some landscaping there and add a bike path uh, in line with uh, the principle called the transit oriented development, uh, which aims to uh, encourage active transport, uh, mainly through uh, landscaping and making the the, the infrastructure more uh, more pleasant and more available. And so, what you need to know as well is there's a, a subway station and the the train station just like two minutes north of the site here. So that's why it makes sense to have a bike path connecting the neighborhoods and this uh, this station. And so uh, with uh, Daniel, with this, he discussed to us uh, about the challenge and opportunities presented by this specific project. So uh, that's what we'll talk about. So uh, this is what the site looks like today, a portion of the, the site. Um, so you can see uh, the, the bike path is here and there's a large area, grassy area with like the small trees and uh, shrubs and uh, there's also flowers at some of the spaces and we'll discuss a bit about uh, the trees that we see on the other side of the road by the parking and so I'll approach this uh, th this discussion about the site uh, through uh, different par priorities that uh, Daniel uh, told us about that they had when they the uh, when they um, landscaped uh, this site first one is water management so uh, as per uh, city rules they have to manage with uh, the soil uh, the first 20 25 millimeters of rain and so uh, as you can see in the left picture here uh, we, we see a portion of the bike path here so in between the bike path and the road there's these little gaps um, where rain can accumulate up to 25 uh, millimeters and then the the surplus would get uh, drawn in this little drain hole here uh, in different pictures we'll see that there's a, a few trees planted as well uh, along this uh, this portion of the site and then on the other side of the road we have these uh, I think he called them water water forest or something like that so they're mainly designed to uh, to drain the water all the way up to uh, these little basins uh, where uh, you have plants growing and trees, shrubs and trees uh, that will consume the water. At this time of the year, it's pretty dry, so uh, there was no water there, but uh, you get the idea. The second priority was uh, pro the protection of existing trees. And so we have uh, two good example here on the left. Uh, those are the trees that were present along the the railway uh, outside of the of the uh, the site um, boundaries and so what they did uh, considering that these trees already pretty big will continue to grow in diameter they uh, they changed the like they had the fence deviate a little bit from he, from this uh, the, like the perfect line to uh, kind of make some room for the tree to continue growing so that doesn't have any problems in the next uh, next decades. And on the right side, uh, there was a, a pear a pear tree uh, already present, probably planted by one of the workers who uh, might have lived there. Uh, so they made the decision to keep it there. Uh, it's a nice addition to the surrounding. Uh, it's it's pretty uh, refreshing to see fruits in the tree as well, although it has some downside. Uh, you can see the fruits on the ground, so it can obviously uh, attract pests. Uh, there were a lot of like rotten fruits and lots of flies, but in terms of uh, of prettiness, uh, the the pear tree was was uh, a nice addition. And so there wasn't a lot of of trees already on the side of the road, so that's where they added most of them. But considering the height of the trees already outside of the of the site uh, they could have cut everything down to make uh, room for the the landscaping but uh, they decided to preserve it and I think that was, that was a really good idea uh, and then the third priority was uh, tree and species uh, richness 
So as you can see on the picture here and the ones I presented earlier, uh, there's different kinds of trees, different species of trees, coniferous, uh, deciduous, there's uh, shrubs, uh, types of grass, uh, flowers, as you can see over here. So it's, it's um, there's good diversity of, of, uh, of species, but also of height and maybe I can say functions as well. Um, and maybe I should just mention that the uh, the objective of uh, the landscaping was to increase the canopy cover to 40%, which is the, the goal for uh, the city in terms of canopy cover in parks. And since it's a bike path in an area where uh, it's usually uh, uh, very warm because it's a lot of concrete and, and cement, uh, this kind of uh, canopy cover uh, will be much appreciated for the bikers here. And so I'll uh, give the floor to uh, Sarah, who will uh, talk to you about the challenge uh, involving with this uh, this project and go on with the next uh, sites afterwards. It's okay, so when they uh, designed this uh, plantation and they had some challenges. So first is the density of trees because um, to plant a lot of trees like this, it's uh, it has a cost and it's not cheap, and so that's why they don't they didn't plant trees uh, really at a high density. So yes, and another reason for this uh, the choice of this density of trees is that um, for for safety. So when people uh, walk in this uh, area. Uh, if there is a lot, there are a lot of trees and a lot of, uh, yes, a co canopy cover. So uh, people are more, um, they can, they can, it can be, a, they can be a, a lot of uh, criminality when there are more, there is more um, criminality maybe when the canopy cover is more important. So that's why they choose to um, to reduce the density of trees in this area. Um, when they, uh, after the tree planting, they, um, they observed that uh, there, were, there was a, a dieback, dieback of uh, some trees, uh, about 20%. So maybe it, they, Daniel, uh, Daniel said that it, uh, it's because of drought and the heat waves uh, during the last uh, two years. So, and then we move to another area. Uh, this is um, an area, a uh, research project from Hugo, which is here too. And uh, this is his uh, MSc uh, project. And it's, um, the goal of this uh, research project is to um, to study the temper the temperature um, in area uh, just uh, um, near the highway uh, exit and with a lot of traffic and because this uh, it, yes it's to uh, study this uh, temperatures uh, gradient in order to uh, to see how important it is to uh, develop this canopy cover uh, in those areas to reduce the temperature uh, near this area but also um, it has an impact on the whole temperature of the the whole uh, city and before there were there weren't any studies about these uh, areas because uh, people don't know, they don't see the interest of the research interest of uh, to study uh, the temperatures or this uh, this area, um, this area because uh, no one lived there, so. It doesn't, uh, it's not important to study this. 
And so Hugo uh, decided to, with uh, the lab, to uh, study this. And uh, he put some um, different sensors, temperature sensors, as a, a transect. There are uh, 10 sensors, I think, uh, between the road and the, the center of the canopy cover. And each uh, sensor uh, measures the temperature um, every 15 minutes and during the whole uh, summer period. And this is to see the, the variation uh, of temperatures um, during the, the period, the season, and also um, between the, the road and the difference between the road and the, the canopy cover, and he he doesn't he, did, he doesn't have any result. He doesn't treat analyze it, his results, but he said that uh, when he go into uh, he goes into the canopy cover, the temperature is lower than when you are uh, at the center, which is a uh, the closer to the closer to the road, and um, yes, so this is the research experiment. Uh, and yes, after we move to another area, so this is also at the highway exit, and they. It's also an experiment uh, project. They plant a lot of trees uh, in this area, but with different uh, methods. So, um, because of different goals, of course. And the first one is to reduce, the first objective it was to reduce the, the cost of plantation. So there is different, Technique of that. Uh, the first one is to uh, plant some. Uh, there is different goals of these methods. Low cost is one of the goals, but there was also, uh, for example, to reduce the wind and the impact of wind and the impact of the icing salt, uh, which come from the road. Um, they plant some shrubs barrier and after they plant the trees. So yeah, the shrubs uh, will do, will have the role of the a barrier for the rain and the de-icing salt. And this is one of the methods. And they have also another method to, it's to plant at high tree density every 75 centimeter, I think. Um, this is also uh, to reduce the impact of the wind and the, the icing salt, because the first trees will stop all neg this negative e effects. Um, another method is to make some soil inversion plantation. So this is some little hill and they yeah they took take the i uh, yes this picture is better <laughs> they take the soil and they invest it uh, as you can see on the right um and they planted some trees um in the the slope it's to improve the soil quality because here uh, the soil is very bad, and can we we say that it is it a, a soil? We don't know because it's there is no organic matter, and and there is a lot of um, block of concrete and also a metal. Uh, yes, the the soil conditions are not good at all, so they make this hill, this mound, to, for the trees to have the, the, a better place for 
for their woods and also uh, to um, for the water to that it, it can drain uh, more for the water is and uh, so they plant a lot of trees like this with different species all uh, species are um, species uh, which that we can uh, find in those areas uh, in natural environment. Um, this plantation, um, uh, the trees was planted, I think in spring 2020. So it's a new experiment. And we will see that in how it that the, the goal of this experiment is to see which species um, is more adapted to this uh, area, uh, this uh, environment, and also um, if it works, yes, with, and which method is the best for in this uh, environment. Yes. I think I, I said all the things. Yep, so that's uh, what we had for today. And we want to thank our colleagues who uh, kindly presented their uh, research product like this. It was uh, pretty interesting. Great, thank you very much, uh, Julien and Sarah. Um, do we have any questions from uh, elsewhere in Canada or abroad? See a lot of clapping, so. Anyone? So maybe I'll ask you. Sorry, oh. I, I, I don't I don't really have a question, although I'm hoping the group in Toronto will bring it up too, because we did look at some sites, um, you know, where restoration planting and hopefully it, it'll expand. I think this discussion of trying to get um, you know, trees, well, trying to integrate the research, but getting getting better understanding of what research questions needed to be asked in order to, to actually do this better, I guess. So I, thanks for the, the overview. Like I, I, I think it'll come up again <laughs> from my end. Uh, but Benoit, just a comment on this, the, the last slide that was presented. Um, I think Anik uh, did a good job at showing how the soil was actually inappropriate for probably growing trees. And this made me think that maybe we should look at what people do when they want to reclaim mines. Actually, they start from scratch to rebuild the soil. And I know there's lots of activities across Canada to bring back some trees and vegetation and ecosystem on mines. And I think there could be some um, ideas we can get and even approach we can get. And I mm -hmm. was feeling that maybe we need to bring some basic um, plants that will actually rebuild the soil, rebuild the, the structure, bring some organic matter. And then maybe in 10, 20 years, we could maybe even think of starting to put some trees that are even more demanding. But anyway, that was just an idea that we talked a little bit about. Yeah, just to follow up on that, Christian, I had a lot of colleagues in Alberta when I did my PhD over there that worked on uh, mine reclamation. And they actually tried different depths of organic matter from forest soils, um, 10, 10, 15, 20 centimeters. And they often found that they didn't even have to replant trees. Sometimes they had bank, seeds from the seed bank in those soils that would grow right away. Um, but they were able to replant trees within one or two years after they just dumped that soil on top. Um, and so they were fairly successful at doing so. So I have a topic that I want to bring back from the presentation. I think as, as Sandy said, there's a, there's quite a few things I think that are going to echo with uh, what Menelik is going to show from what we did today. Uh, but uh, you mentioned that they put in shrubs to uh, attenuate the effect of road salt. And that was actually a topic that came up today as well for us. Uh, and I was wondering if you could explain on that and give us just a, a few specs into like how tall are these shrubs are they how, how wide is that band to, to separate from the road 
um, one thing that that we uh, a possibility that we entertained they hadn't done it at the site that we that we visited today was to put in uh, rows of conifers that stay that are obviously have their needles in the in their in all their air filtration qualities in the winter as well which when the when the soil gets airborne and so I'm wondering about the sort of the rationale uh, behind the, the shrub because this is the first time that I hear this. Maybe I should answer because it was my project when I was uh, in the city of Laval. So um, yeah, we put some shrub in the, uh, the, 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 the next to the, the road. Uh, we try different species. We try Salix uh, miyabena, which is uh, sometimes used for um, vegetal wall. Uh, I think it's working well. We'll see in a couple of years. Uh, we plant also some uh, Carnus uh, Stolonifera um, uh, viburnum species also. And uh, as uh, Sarah says, uh, we, we planted really dense, the trees, but also the shrubs. The shrubs were planted at 30 centimeters each apart. So it was very, very dense. It, it's like the we want to create a, a natural barrier. And we chose our species um, from uh, last uh, plantation, like 20 years ago, and we saw which species uh, did well uh, next to the roads. Uh, so this is more about which, which shrub species like succeeded. Did you, did you have a look in to see how much salt was uh, actually reaching in behind that barrier or, or is Not that yet. in the future? Uh, I don't know, Hugo, I don't, uh, because uh, it's uh, already two years ago, so <laughs> I forgot a lot of things. Hugo, I don't know if you remember, uh, was the salt uh, less in the center of the exchange uh, highway exit? Uh, we didn't took sample after the shrubs were uh, planted. We didn't took sample like in front and back of the shrubs, but because this is not, I mean, my uh, research project, but it's something quite interesting to see if like there is a, a real impact of those shrubs on the salinity content in front and back of those lines. But no, I didn't took any samples and I don't think it's in the contract mm -hmm. for the salt for this uh, and, and just, to right. yep. just to follow up on Francois what was the reason to choose shrub versus like conifers that would actually probably be more of a physical barrier in the winter than the shrubs that lose all their leaves in this in the winter yeah but we plant also a lot of, uh, of conifers in, okay. the, in this project, uh, but we didn't plant it just in front. In the other project, I remember they planted the conifers in front. Uh, there was the um, shrubs, conifers, and then the trees. But we wanted some more, something more diverse, uh, and also it was easier for the planting people <laughs> on the ground to to plant uh, the, the the trees uh, aleatoirement, let's say, everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we planted the uh, 25,000 trees and shrubs, so it was a lot of species. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could uh, expand on that a little bit. But so far, you, you guys talked about the physical barrier above ground. But I had in mind that uh, most of the salt would come from like melting snow in the spring. No, uh, not that much. Okay. But then the roots can also like uh, make the water drain more uh, vertically instead of uh, like running on top mm -hmm. order from the road, I guess. I think the big, I think the big problem is the plume when they, when they, dump the, when they, when they dump the salt, it creates like all this salt dust that mm. just like, and, and that's how it gets really far. And, and that the, the water, the dissolved salt, it gets far, but not that far. Mm. Thank you. It's not from the plowing that you plow the snow and it's also yeah. But the plantation on those sites were quite far from the roads because there is like uh, I think nine meters of uh, security uh, space mm. we need to keep free, and after that after that there is like five meter depends of the plantation 
from the road. But uh, I think the, the, the shrubs were there for mainly uh, wind during the summer. And I think not in the winter, if you consider that there is no leaf in the winter on Salix and on Cornus. So yeah, I think it's mainly from, from the wind in the summer that they were used better in, the, in winter. Matt? Yeah, um, I had a question and, uh, because uh, Pierre mentioned uh, uh, um, about the crime uh, idea and, you know, so the, the open the canopy up so that we don't have crime and we don't have concern. The last I looked a couple of years ago, like the, the research was sort of showing that canopy cover decreased crime. I'm wondering if there's anything recent out there. I mean, it's been a few years since I've looked, so just kind of polling the group what the general consensus is on reduction in crime uh, due to plantations. Right. Anybody I don't know has if, it? So if, if nobody has any like current information, I'm going to chip in. Sorry, there's some some like it's, serious it's like not, airport. Yeah, it's not that's clear it's near not, the airport or yeah. something. <laughs> um, I I believe uh, that the, so there's data that shows that can, increasing canopy cover sort of we mentioned you know gentrification and so on and can definitely has some strong correlates with crime, but I think in urban parks, it has to do with uh, visibility at height, uh, at person height that uh, is, is it, uh, empirically or not, people perceive it as uh, associated with crime. Uh, and so, and women, for instance, walking at night in urban parks where there's low visibility, uh it increases like all kinds of things so so i think it has more to do with the shrub layer and and sort of everything that's in the understory but this morning when daniel talked about it and i think uh, yesterday when we talked about it it wasn't more like a, a higher rate of crime with the higher canopy cover but more like a, with the higher canopy cover is a, a, this I don't, the security feeling for mainly women was uh, lower than in a lower canopy cover uh, city. Is he, talking, it, is he talking about trees though, or like- No tree, but uh, density uh, and I mean density, but also if we look at the conifers and mainly if it's darker because the canopy is more dense, it was like, it's, it's more a feeling of uh, security and uh, then a crime rate that we I think that we were talking about and that like there was higher rate of crime in relation with this higher canopy cover because women were more, but mainly women were more uh, treated by the higher canopy cover. But yes, I think, I think the, this is the, the the nuance between those two. Uh... Can it be because it's at the plantation stage? So the trees they're planting are two meters, three to four meters high, and they have branches pretty low. And so if you plant those at a high density, it, it is a vertical wall at the height that Francoise is mentioning. Maybe in 15 to 20 years, it won't feel as much of a closed wall. Uh, but immediately after plantation, that might be the effect if you have really high density of plantations uh, of trees on, in those areas. Yes, if I can add something, uh, what Daniel said uh, this morning is that for the design of uh, this uh, plantation near the, the walkway, um, what we from this morning, that when they design it, uh, they have to for the, the, the question of criminality, they have to uh, plant uh, trees, uh, the density, or I, I don't know what is impacting this, uh, the high or the, the density, but people, when they walk uh, in this uh, walkway, they have to, they need to see the road for the, the visibility, yes, this is the, the, the criterion. Right. 
I think he he mentioned uh, since it's a bike bike path at all, if there's an accident or something, it's best if there's some openings and we can see from the road uh, what's happening over there as well. But I think the main issue with density uh, w was the cost of tree planting. That's what determined like the density of trees that they put, but the other consideration were still uh, still present. Okay, maybe we should, uh, these are all interesting discussions, but we wanna keep some time for the other groups. Uh, so maybe we'll move to the Toronto group that can uh, show us uh, what they did this morning. Thanks, Benoit. Uh, I think I'm gonna be speaking first, but Francois is gonna share the screen for us. Uh, that is one of our sites, but not the first one. <laughs> you guys are getting a quick preview of our slides. <laughs> All right, great. So, um, yeah, today we had a pretty exciting day uh, taking a look at parts of the east end of Scarborough, so uh, the North York and east end of uh, uh, Scarborough near the Rouge Park. Um, so um, yeah, next slide, Francois. Yeah, to, to start, we started with uh, Betty Sutherland Trail, which is uh, situated nearby the 401. Uh, honestly, uh, Amory, uh, gave you guys all a pretty in-depth discussion as to uh, the sites that we visited, but I'll go over it again pretty quickly. So the first one, again, is the Betty Sutherland Trail Park, and it's, like I mentioned, really nearby the 401. Um, next slide, just to give you a, a quick image of what it looks like on the ground. It's uh, a recent um, plantation style uh, uh, reforestation that they've done in partnership with several organizations. So. Um, uh, Vinelands Canada, I believe, as well as the Highway of Heroes, like Amory mentioned, and they have several species, what looked like mostly maple and oak and some uh, uh, white pine, someone from Toronto, correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, uh, and uh, next slide as well. And at this site, oh, too far. At this site, there was quite a lot of considerations as to the prior conditions, right there, uh, as to the prior conditions on the site. Um, they had initially attempted to uh, uh, plant on this site in previous years, I believe two years, uh, two years before 2020, which is 2018, um, and had seen poor success um, from their uh, tree planting contractors. Um, on the site following that two year uh, checkup on the site, uh, lots of mortality. Uh, and so they took a, a new approach in 2020 when they went in and redid their planting with um, an extensive set of uh, both preparation and maintenance on the site. And so you can kind of see uh, several different images of the different methods they used. They did a bit of soil uh, ripping, which is there's this uh, uh, large piece of equipment attached to a tractor that they used to um, kind of uncompact the soil situated there. Amory might have mentioned that this uh, was expected to be largely made up of uh, fill that was deposited from the construction of the 401 on those sites. So um, it was a very open area with not a lot of larger species growing, mostly just meadows um, that was potentially slated for development, but was never given up by the city to be made into one of the various apartments or uh, kind of suburban areas that are sometimes located all around uh, Toronto near the 401. But following the uncompacting of the soil, um, they brought in um, uh, organic material, such as uh, mostly large, large amounts of compost that they, they stressed the amounts of compost that they brought in to sort of remediate the soil conditions on the ground. And then followed that by a set of uh, rotor tilling um, that they did to kind of uh, mix and prepare the site for tree planting that spring in 2020. Uh, and so next image. And then actually following the tree planting itself, um, they, they've actually put in uh, quite um, larger caliper trees, um, not massive, but uh, still larger than your average uh, 
uh, seedling, which may be seen at some uh, reforestation projects, and follow that up with lots of maintenance as well to make sure that um, these trees were surviving because um, they had determined that enough money and effort was going into the actual um, uh, establishing of this site that they wanted to ensure its success. And so that involved um, lots of staking, rodent guards, uh, and of course, um, uh, irrigation, um, which was very needed in the end of that summer, which was uh, quite a hot, dry uh, spell near the end. Uh, and uh, this uh, irrigation system is set up with a drip line that uh, runs uh, between the rows of trees and is connected to a fire hydrant nearby in one of the nearby background apartments that you can see in some of these images. Um, beyond that, um, next slide. Beyond that, they mentioned some of the goals that they had for this site. And um, as is mentioned, uh, and is the kind of focus of most of the conversations, it's about canopy cover, the overall increasing of the canopy cover that they're gonna be seeing uh, across the whole city. And so here um, was a great opportunity to kind of increase uh, the canopy cover in a specific uh, area. Uh, in addition, they also mentioned some of their goals of, um, you know, kind of, improving the publicly accessible spaces that are available to Toronto citizens, which is like a major goal of uh, the folks at the city of Toronto. Um, so kind of see us here walking through the trail uh, of this re reforestation site. And then um, lastly, of course, the position of uh, this site near the 401 provides op several opportunities for things like uh, sound remediation or sound barriers against the, um, the frequent traffic that's on the 401. Uh, as well as um, potentially slowing down some of that uh, salt spray um, that comes off of the 401. So um, these are some of the objectives and goals that were touted um, as we were having our walk around at this site. Um, and I may have meant, missed some, but um, I'm going to pass it on to, well, next slide. Yeah, so I'm going to pass it on to Francois, who will be taking over the second site and if she feels like she can add anything that I missed from that first site visit. Uh, well, I don't know, maybe I just, uh, I, I did have like a one detail because I think, I think the, the, this park was, is right on, the fact that it's right on the 401, which is one of these big highways, but it's also the highway of heroes and one of the big ways in which they uh, yeah. paid for this uh, pretty like intense, like, uh, planting effort was through a planting program associated with the Highway of Heroes, where they try to plant, they, they are actively looking around for potential sites to add trees along that highway. And mm -hmm. so I think I think those were major partners. Anyway, just to, yeah. and just to I think, think. I think I would just add also that um, I think it was Amory who mentioned that is thanks to the sort of like partnerships that are developed with like multiple different organizations, whether that's like the Highway of Heroes or Vineland that they're able to like try out new methods for say dealing with like compaction and DSV or also just get access to areas that are along the highways which are normally managed by uh, non-municipal organizations but rather the provincial uh, bodies that would normally not give access to say a, a, a municipal uh, tree or forest uh, forestry departments to kind of go in and do the tree planting so that was I thought was one of those neat takeaways um, kind of that interconnections between uh, departments at different levels. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna take over since Meng like, I think you said you, you said you may have to jet. Uh. <laughs> All right, so uh, from, uh, so I think Meng like just showed that, so the first example that we saw today was definitely a, one way to do intensive replanting in a sort of high value area where a lot of people are gonna use it, uh, but where means are possible and things like fire hydrants are accessible. And so the second site where we moved to uh, I think I skipped some things. The second site where we move uh, really to uh, the very edge of the city of Toronto is, is kind of the polar opposite in that uh, there, the amount of effort per hectare that you can put in is going to be uh, limited, but the challenges are still significant. And so we visited the Bear Hill Park, uh, which is its new name, because uh, if you had gone there 50, 40 years ago, it would have been uh, the Bear Hill Landfill. And so at that time in the 60s, this would have been sort of the edge of the city of Toronto, uh, whereas now, 
it's firmly sandwiched in between the city of Toronto and sort of the bedroom uh, communities uh, that are beyond Rouge Park, so Pickering and so on. In the area, you have a nuclear reactor just feeding uh, the Toronto area. Uh, there's the Toronto Zoo, but there's also uh, the Rouge National Park. And so uh, Rouge National Park has been ceded from some of these uh, watershed level uh, management authorities that we were discussing yesterday, the TICA. They've been put in the care of Parks Canada, but Parks Canada looked at the map, they saw their hill and they decided they did not want it. I, we're all shocked. And so uh, their hill was a um, landfill that was active from 1967 to 1983. And so it closed then. Um, so what else do I have? Uh, what has happened since then? I apologize if I missed some details, but we're gonna... So what has happened since then uh, is that as happens when you decommission a landfill, they've covered over uh, the landfill with a clay layer that is meant to sort of put a, a, a hard cap on the mountain. And, uh, and then they, they sort of put a whole layer of topsoil over top of that. And this thing settles or has been sort of slowly settling since 1983. And so uh, currently the garbage uh, starts at about a depth of two meters. Uh, so, and, and that fact kind of colors everything about what you can do on this site. Because uh, you have to be careful about anything that goes into the ground and soil stability and everything. Uh, so for a while, uh, there, there's ways to sort of try to extract value out of old landfills. Uh, for uh, since the 80s, there had been a methane plant that uh, uh, sort of captured the methane that was coming out of the of the landfill and fed the energy back into the Ontario grid. Uh, but now uh, the methane emissions have gone down to the level where it was no, no longer economically feasible for the company that did it to carry on. So uh, essentially the company up and left. Uh, and uh, so the methane wells that would normally be in an old landfill to, uh, to extract the gas have been removed. And it's now considered that the methane emissions are, are minimal uh, and not particularly uh, worrisome. Uh, so yeah, so now it's, so this whole property, we're talking about 75 hectares is now in the care of the um, solid waste department. Uh, which essentially, uh, so a low, no, land, no landfill like this is going to be in the care of some department in perpetuity, basically. So this is going to be under the, 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 the administration of the city of Toronto forever. Um, but since then, uh, so the methane company is gone, uh, the soil is settling, things have started receding on their own. Uh, there have been a few uh, citizen groups like the Friends of the Rouge that have been planting a few um, unexpected trees. So we found uh, sycamore and a few other sort of surprising things on there uh, because of local citizens that are, that are implicated and kind of want to see this uh, open as a park. Um, but for the most part, things that have been done by the city of Toronto have uh, primarily emphasized uh, native plantings. Uh, as I said, the fact that it's an old landfill kind of changes everything. So you can't do the kind of heavy site preparation that you would do in the site that Menelik uh, showed before, because you can't do tilling. Anything that rips up the soil is way off limits. Uh, so, so what you can do is just sort of add soil. If you want to plant something, you just like, you have to add additional topsoil. Uh, and so sort of that kind of uh, determines the, the whole thing. Uh, they have been doing uh, some planting in addition to all the stuff that, you know, has grown over the last 40 years. Uh, one of their main focus has been on sort of channeling uh, pedestrian and other uses. And so there were old maintenance roads uh, from the old site from monitoring uh, where they've specifically targeted for planting. I think there are some trees in there, uh, but maybe I'll, oops, uh, 
uh, uh, where they do all native species. Obviously there's deer in the area, so they have to have uh, really big deer fences. And apparently they've been catching deer in the fences. So now they're using flagging tape to let the deer know that there's a fence there. Um, and, uh, and so now, right now, what they can do for this large of an area is mainly focused on these sort of old roads where they're trying to get the park ready uh, to, and, and so that people won't go walking on these old roads that are meant to be decommissioned. Um, I think that's what I've got to say about this. Uh, somebody very good at taking notes noted that they planted something like 13,000 native trees and shrubs. So anyway, an Im impressive stuff, all of this. Um, so uh, there are still like pretty big challenges about what can be done on the site or what cannot be done. So there is still, for instance, water coming out of this garbage pile. In theory, this water is all passing all of the checks that it needs to pass from Environment Canada and so on. But there, I perceived, and I'd be curious what the others thought, but there's a big sort of visibility problem. And so apparently the authorities are quite concerned about what people are gonna make out of this old landfill. And so they don't want anybody to ask questions about puddles of water. And so there's now big, uh, there's a lot of effort into putting sort of, um, water uh, water loving uh, trees and shrubs that are going to soak up these puddles because even though this water is technically passes all the checks and balances we don't want anybody to ask any questions apparently um, and then uh, so th so that's sort of the bottom picture here looking down at the bottom of the at the bottom of the hill uh, these puddles are happening there and then, Predictably, at the top, there's uh, we could see uh, sort of signs of drought stress. Uh, I don't know that they're uh, really following that up, but it's for sure sort of water limited at the top with this sort of thick clay cap over the whole thing, uh, acting as a major water barrier and, and sort of channeling the water and creating kind of hydrological uh, conditions that are uh, for which it's it's a bit tricky to find locally what would be the best species mix. And so I think they've been looking looking at other upland sites to decide what to plant, but there are still tricky areas. And so up in this top left corner, you're seeing an area with uh, bare soils that is um, sort of not at the top, but near, near the top and where for some reason, uh, no vegetation seems to be uh, getting sort of taking hold. Even any of the invasive species that are very abundant in the site don't seem to be uh, sort of hanging on in there. And there are remaining questions about maybe there is soil pollution. Uh, and so I think there's a ton of, of work to be done and, and, and carried on uh, to try to find solutions for, for the site, because obviously uh, in an area where you may have people walking in the area, you don't want bare soil that's going to start eroding. Erosion is a major concern um, for this kind of site. Uh, so right now, uh, Bear Hill Park uh, is, no, is not yet open for the public, but it's been ready to be open for quite some time. It's just sort of the, the last preparations from, uh, from the, the landfill experts uh, to make it ready, but they are experiencing significant problems with locals that over the past 40 years have gotten extremely used to having access to this site. And, with, and so with recurrent sort of access cutting and cuttings of fences, uh, we encountered, oh, at least three or four trespassers on our walk there this morning. And that was just like a one hour window. And so this, is, this promises to be a very popular park. Uh, but right now, uh, there are still a few boxes to tick, uh, but you basically, this is like, you get, this is, so this site, the summit of this heap is uh, 60 meters above grade, you get a 360 degree view over the whole area from Pickering and the, the nuclear plant to almost kind of you can see the CN Tower and apparently somebody tells me we could see Niagara Falls I don't know 
uh, I'll wait till I see it. Uh, and uh, and all of this is on like 900, 900 ton million tons of garbage. Uh, in terms of goals, I think um, opening the park at this stage would be a, a big achievement. They have significant challenges with invasive species, especially dark strangling vine, which is uh, dominant in the area. But I, I personally did not see much buckthorn, which is another one that we could have expected to see there. But I think those are challenges for the future. Uh, as it is, I don't think they're, they're not uh, intending to plant trees everywhere as some of these areas are really hydrologically challenged. So they have some uh, non-negative grass pra prairies that have established already and that are used by uh, uh, rare or at-risk species like the bubble ink. Uh, and I think they are intending to keep them as meadows. And so here in this sort of really large area, sort of 75 hectares, uh, they're going to prioritize sort of a, a mosaic uh, of different habitats with maybe trees in some areas and, and more um, more open areas where the people can see you uh, in other places. Um, I think I said everything, but I'll open it up to my teammates to if they have anything to add. I, I think you got everything, but I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in. I feel like you covered anything I wrote down though. Anyone else from Toronto wanted to add a, a grain of salt? Yeah, I think one other important thing that um, <clears throat> sorry that she said was what, when we were asking her about canopy cover, if that was something they were managing for, she said yes to some degree, but on this park, they're managing more for a diversity of habitat instead of a diversity of canopy cover and really for recreation um, opportunities for the community. So while canopy cover is something that is important to them and they're trying to highlight in the park, this also shows that you know, they're highlighting a lot of different other different uses and ecosystem services um, besides that. Good. I have a quick question. Did it smell anything? No. Being on top of all that garbage, there's no it, garbage odor at all. It, it was really hot. Mm, impressive. Did they, did they have a membrane or something? How do they keep the odor in the ground? There's like a thick layer of clay that is sitting on all this. And all this stuff has been like decomposing for, you know, 40 years, so. Yeah, this is, a, this is very much an engineering. Um, the engineers have this down as a, you know, a pat way of how to deal with landfills. Um, so, you know, it, it was an interesting um, site visit as you described, Francois. It's, um, you know, it's, you can achieve more canopy cover, but it has such a variable uh, purpose or goals. It's, it's not your typical, which is what Kit also alluded to. And it's very difficult sites. So they're hugely challenging for, for multiple reasons. It very much is kind of a, oh, a PR. It's a, a, a you know, public relations. It's about getting the public on board. Not only did they, I think it was Lisa said, uh, you know, that the issue of puddling water, but also the bare soil, they were working really hard to figure out why thing, why there was no plants, not just trees, but any grass or anything growing on these bare patches. And it was sort of like I said, well, why don't you let just nature, we go back to this natural region and sort of these sites are you know, nature can bring a lot in on its own. It'll, it'll let us know what'll survive. Um, and she said, oh no, because this is the provincial government. And if there's bare patches, then the public will perceive it as toxicity. So they'll be asking kind of the question you asked Benoit, they'll be mm -hmm. thinking about smells and they'll be thinking about all the bad things that are in there. But it has, I think she said on average, was it two or three meters of clay? Like these are capped off. Uh, then the methane's pulled off for, was it 20, 30 years? It's actually used for uh, generating energy that goes into the hydro grid. So by this time, and it keeps slowly settling, but by this time, the clay cap is pretty good. And once the trees get established, uh, it'll cover it and it'll prevent erosion. Some of the issues are erosion on these sites. Mm. So are trees concerns? are really important, but you know. 
but they concerns that their root from the trees might kind of breach the clay cap and allow some think... of those gas to no no because most of the gas are being pulled off on mm. like they have actual exit sections okay. for it like i've seen newer landfills there's a but, whole large number of these landfills that's an older one that's been decommissioned but, uh, a lot of the issues that they the ministry is worried about really seems to be about public uh perception People. francois yeah. brought up a really interesting point when we are on the walk that it would be interesting if they had actually maybe leaned more into it being a reclaim like a closed landfill that they had turned into a park and some of their marketing and had maybe had some sign and educational uh, material about that it would have maybe it would be interesting to maybe see what the public response would be um for these sorts of projects in the future the public right. doesn't even know on many of these sites um you know some of the landfills have been turned into golf courses i mean they're not just parks like the public doesn't know and many of these landfills there's been a lot of new subdivisions put in beside them they didn't even know that they were buying a house around an old landfill um and and but i think there that it's not necessarily bad like i think this is a good example of engineers the silos that we've created like you've got engineers who are doing this and i they haven't really talked to foresters foresters are kind of well they they're not even connecting with them like they've dealt with the problem from an engineering end but there's so much more and as you say kit it even the public there was so much more you could get in a positive way out of this, if you acknowledged up front that we create garbage in our societies and it has to go somewhere. Like, I mean, <laughs> this way you're hiding it almost. Like, it's like, oh, no problem with garbage. Like, yeah, but there is a problem. Keep producing it, we can hide it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, forestry could help here, but it's a challenge. Anyone else want to ask a question uh, for the people from Toronto? If not, maybe we'll uh, quickly move along to uh, our folks from B UBC. Um, so Caitlin and Joanna, uh, who can uh, start their presentation. Cool, okay. And Joanna is not driving today, so it'll be easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's getting late for her. Yeah, it's 10 30 almost. <laughs> <laughs> trying to be like <laughs> yeah so i know we're a little over time so we'll try to make it concise um so yeah i'm gonna go first um talk a little bit about vancouver um so today um oh i was just gonna say too i'm very jealous of everyone's um like field trips that they gotta go on and, and it's nice to kind of see what what all the different cities are doing in terms of adding trees to their cities um so for me, I'm just kind of diving a bit into what Vancouver is doing, what their strategy is for planting trees, um, what kinds of challenges they're kind of finding for planting trees, um, the legacy of, you know, the previous plantings that have happened over the years and how that's kind of shaped um, what the structure of the urban forest looks like today, especially with the flowering shade trees. Um, I'll touch upon the role of native species and new tree plantings, and then I kind of start thinking about like the governance of street trees, um, which I know we'll talk about a little bit in the next few days. Um, so on the right here, um, this is a new tree planting that I came across yesterday. Um, and it was a part of, and I'll probably show pictures of this maybe on, I think on Thursday when we're talking about like policy. Uh, but on the left over here, there's a big like new um, apartment building and all these trees are, are brand new. And it was actually, I think this is one of the largest like caliper trees I've seen planted. Um, so these are all new trees. And I think I took a few photos as well as like, it looked like these um, kind of squares of pavement kind of lifted up. Um, so I didn't see the trees actually getting planted, but um, I'd be interested to know kind of like if they used, you know, kind of the structural soils um, or the cells or anything like that. Um, but, and I think I remember seeing that this might be part of the, like the policy, um, as I touched upon yesterday, um, the city and the park board um, view like developers and landowners as a big, playing a big role in adding new trees to the city. So it'll be interesting to look into. Um, but yeah, so um, just touching upon quick, as I mentioned yesterday, 
Um, there's five kind of like big goals that the city has for um, for the urban forest, one of which was to plant trees to grow the urban forest. And these are some of the kind of core principles. Um, so to do this, they the, these are like their kind of um, four guiding goals for that. They want to increase tree planting in neighborhoods with low urban forest cover. They want to enhance biodiversity through tree planting. I think when they talk about biodiversity here, they're speaking about like pollinators, um, insects and birds. Um, they also want to increase street and park tree diversity. And within the urban forest strategy, they touch upon species diversity, age and size diversity, and they even mention genetic diversity. And they kind of start talking about like the role of nurseries, which we were kind of talking about earlier. So they mention it. I don't know exactly how they like address that, but they do mention that, you know, these nurseries really are having like similar like genes um, and that that can be kind of a problem when we're introducing these trees, you know, to the city and they're all coming from somewhere else. Um, you know, even if they were to be native, they're not like maybe like genetically from the area. Um, so I thought it was interesting that they at least are addressing that in the strategy. And then plant trees to support green infrastructure and reduce climate change impacts. So um, one of the big challenges um, in planting the trees um, that the city found, you know, of course, their goal is to get to 30% canopy cover by 2050, um, but they point to impervious surfaces um, as a, a major challenge beyond another one was urban development, which I'll probably touch upon in the next few days, but impervious surfaces is, is a really big challenge for them. As we've discussed today, um, limits space, soil volume, it limits the ability for water to, to get in, um, get to the roots. And the city found that once impermeability exceeded 50% on the block, um, the tree canopy was usually less than 10%. And they also found that about half of their city blocks exceed 50% impermeability. So this is a, another map of how they've kind of um, you know, visualize the data. Um, and this helps them to kind of, um, you know, figure out where they can plant trees. And this is from the city as well. Um, this is what 25 to 50% impermeability looks like. And this is what over 75% impermeability looks like. Here's a picture on Davies Street um, I took yesterday. It's like a commercial district. So it's around here. Um, and as you can see, there's not a lot of room for tree plantings. Um, once in a while, there'll be some, but they're very much, you know, kind of sticking right out of the ground. Again, I'm not sure what the soil looks like underneath. Um, the city does find ways to kind of find like these kind of pedestrian pocket parks, which I might uh, show photos of in the next few days as well. Um, but those kind of add to canopy cover and, and kind of like, uh, create a space for community to gather under at least. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it can be challenging to plant um, trees on these streets where there's not a lot of um, opportunity to. And then in the strategy, they said that, um, let's see, I, I took an exact quote from them, but they say that increasing canopy cover citywide will be more successful if permeable areas can be protected and increased. Um, so again, kind of uh, protecting what they already have um, and maybe increasing that and opening up some of this, th these uh, streets that are just like, like cement. Um, and then impermeable locations and planting sites may need to be built with imported or structural soils, um, as we discussed before, and kind of creating more soil volume underneath the built infrastructure. Um, and then Another thing I kind of explored yesterday is because, um, you know, I had that map of Vancouver and it very much is a city that has a lot of maples and a lot of cherries. And so I was kind of just looking at the history of like tree plantings in the city. And so I found, and, and you know, this might be similar to some other um, cities. I know in a city that I worked in outside of Chicago um, about over a year ago, um, they kind of had a similar story, um, you know, planting these big, large shade trees in the late, you know, 1800s or 1940s. But then by the turn of the century, kind of this movement towards like, you know, the flowering types, the ornamental types. Um, so this was something similar that happened in Vancouver um, in the 1930s and 1950s. They received flowering uh, trees, they were given as gifts. Um, 
And so the city really started taking to that because, you know, these big showy flowers, here's some on the right that I took. This was in the spring when they were flowering. Um, and it's just beautiful. You know, it's like a week or two and all the flowers are blooming and it's definitely um, something, you know, um, aesthetically beautiful to see. So um, again, in the 1950s, they were realizing they were kind of having problems with these big shade trees, um, especially as, you know, the city became, becomes more dense and streets, you know, are changing. So planting plums, hawthorns, and flowering cherries. Um, but by the 1990s, they had hired their first arborist um, and they did an inventory of the city. And they found that 90, of the 90,000 street trees, 36% were flowering plum and cherry. Um, and in the 2000s, I think it was 2007, they had their first urban forestry management plan. And that's when they first kind of started thinking like we need more variety of species to increase diversity, as well as um, at least getting, at least moving away from the problematic non-native species. Um, Cause there were some, I think, I, oh yeah, the hawthorns, crab apples, some of the cherries and the plums. Um, they were just kind of prone to disease and issues. They weren't right for the climate. So they were at least moving away from, from those. And then, um, so then as I kind of like discussed earlier today, um, I was looking at the native species in the urban forestry manage, management plan for Vancouver. They say that native species play a critical role in sustaining biodiversity in the city by providing habitat for native flora and fauna and by providing people with access to nature. Um, but mostly these native species are concentrated in parks. Um, these are the common species that we found then um, on the right. This is actually some conifers I ran into, ran into yesterday um, as street trees. So it was nice, nice to see this little grouping of conifers um, and, kind of, you know, I see it, I see a decent amount of them on the streets. So that's nice. Um, and I have a few pictures. I'll probably share one of the days we're doing tree preservation. There were some that are are lining um, next to a newly being built uh, property. Um, but yeah, so like I said earlier, um, less than 2% though native species are found on the streets. Um, the city finds them unsuitable for urban sites because they grow too large, they're prone to breakage. Um, and you know, at first I, I was kind of like, this was definitely not what I was expecting, but it was nice to kind of hear um, from Christian and Sandy kind of like insights to, to why this might be the case. and. And, you know, it does, it, it would make sense that, you know, especially these really big conifers might be a problem for streets. Um, so while they're not prioritized in the streets, they are being prioritized in the parks at least. Um, and then just quickly, I was trying to find like a, you know, like a preferred species uh, planting list that the city had. Um, their most recent one that I found was from 2011. It's like the first thing that comes up on, you know, like a Google search. Um, and it was kind of like alarming though, because they, for example, list like Norway maple as like the top, you know, top of course, because of Acer, but as like, you know, the first thing to recommend. Um, so not only non-native, but, you know, it can be invasive. And um, so it's just kind of interesting. I haven't seen anything updated um, from the city, um, but yeah. So, and then of course, a lot of like non-native species. So this is just a, a kind of like taste of, of what they're recommending. Um, again, I don't know if this has changed, but it is the first thing you find when you're looking for um, recommendations from the city. And then finally, um, these are just kind of things I'm thinking about as we're going to the, the next few days, because um, I know we're gonna be talking about, you know, the policy um, and like bylaws and things like that and um, residents and NGOs. Um, so thinking about street tree bylaws, you know, how, how does one plant a tree if they want to plant a tree on the street? Um, or how do you get the city to plant a tree? Um, and whose responsibility is it to care for these trees? And so again, I live in, a, in this one neighborhood called West End in Vancouver. And um, I took a few different pictures and this is one. So it's just like really interesting, like tree planting, kind of this type of palm. I'm not familiar with palms, but it has been funny to see it grow because it was like a month ago, it had just one leaf. And it's kind of over time been like growing like more leaves, but we'll see how it goes. And then I think this back there, it might be bamboo or something, but it's just funny because there's kind of these pockets of areas in, in this neighborhood where, you know, there's kind of the signs of care from 
from uh, residents and they either are doing like gardens or like planting things or um, decorating trees and stuff. So I took a few pictures of that and we'll share with you guys probably on Thursday, but it's just interesting to see how, how residents are kind of like, you know, uh, influencing these little pockets. But so yeah, um, I'm happy to either, yeah, take questions now or we can just wait until the end um, and Johanna can share a bit about her hometown. We can take a few quick questions for uh, Caitlin from the audience. Anyone? Yeah, it's Peter. Um, Go ahead, Peter. This, this may not be so much a question as a consideration for all of us to think about. And that is that uh, any comparisons of the amount of territory that's uh, permeable versus impermeable also needs a little bit of thought given to, and uh, pardon me, uh, the verticality of the impermeable. And so we have impermeable surface at street level, on ground level, which is the street and the sidewalk and then parking lots and so on. And then we have impermeable on the roofs of houses that are probably not as tall as the tallest trees. And then we have impermeable that goes up higher and higher and higher, especially in downtown cores. And just about every redevelopment here in Halifax um, is a, um, a eight, six to eight to higher story uh, condo or mixed use or residential uh, uh, apartment building. And it's right up to the street side. And so it, that impermeable roof is way harder on trees than the impermeability of the street because if we have permeable surface beside it, we can at least grow a tree into the airspace uh, of the, of the uh, overtop of the impermeable, but we can't grow a tree in, into the airspace above a tall apartment building. And so I find this impermeable um, uh, analysis and the tree canopy, very interesting, but uh, one a nuance I would give it is to go further and look at how vertical the impermeable uh, is and what's the distribution of that verticalness of the impermeable territory. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree, Peter. That's a good point. Um, yeah, thinking about kind of more like ranges, like you said, because even you know, there's, yeah, like you said, there's types of impermeability that you can adjust and possibly plant a tree. And um, whereas you can't, you know, if it's a building, you know, you can't, no matter what, unless you take down the whole building, which is not going to happen in a, in a dense growing city. Um, whereas if it's like, yeah, just like a sidewalk or something that you can change and adjust a little bit, there's definitely a difference. So, um, but what we, like we've kind of talked about all these measurements, I mean, they have their flaws and their kind of starting points. And it's always good to learn how we can improve upon them for sure. Anyone else had a question or comment for Caitlin? If not, I think we'll uh, move along to uh, Joanna. Um, cool, sounds good. Francois just mentioned that we can also think of green roofs in terms of permeable buildings. So uh, the floor is your, uh, Joanna. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to be really quick. Um, it was super interesting and a lot of information and I'm more like kind of went around about and like look for different uh, ways of additions to um, canopy or in general like trees. Um, so yeah, this first image is like within the big park, this like really, really big famous park. That's kind of like the um, landmark of this whole town or village, um, I found that there are like various trees that have like descriptions on it, which made me kind of think, yeah, uh, like I to myself thought it was like to kind of like foster the connection of the people, not only to famous views, arts and heritage buildings that are there and like very like famous to the city, but also to the trees, which then now I kind of like have a word to, which is like the asset reputation, I guess, kind of like in that direction. Um, so yeah, that was really like helpful to like kind of get a, get a name to it. Um, yeah, you can move ahead, Kitten, thank you. Um, yeah, then, um, yeah, that was like one way where I saw tree planting. So there's a lot of like new construction sites that are being like developed. I don't know, this is not really very new, this area where I went, maybe like within the last 
10 years, I would think. Um, but yeah, so so they did have to plant new trees for once because it was like a new area developed, but also due to climate change and like this bark beetle and some kind of fungus that was there, uh, many trees were weakened and had to be taken down because they were like unstable. Um, so the the species they had taken down is mostly like birches, beeches, and maple, um, supposedly. And they have been like, like for example, in this one area, they've been planting like uh, 500 new trees on a 300 hectare, a uh, 3,000 hectare within this year. That's the plan. So what they've mostly been um, planting, and I'm, I hope that I get the like English names right. So that's like a Turkish hazel, a uh, wild service tree, and field maple. So they kind of changed the the species a bit to make them supposedly more climate resilient. Um, and yeah, this has been like, it's very a very interesting initiative um, because they've been cooperating with the climate activist group. And they actually like, like officially just like collaborating with them for planting all these trees. And there's also like some initiatives about um, adopting a tree and you can either choose to adopt a, like an existing tree, which is more expensive to adopt or plant a new tree. So there's some kind of like citizen involvement. And yeah, there's uh, all over the city, you see a lot of uh, new trees that are being planted. Um, then again, if you switch to the next slide, um, you also see a lot of trees that aren't like that are planted, but they are not really successful. So I was not able to tell which like species of tree they had planted there because it was just not, yeah, it was just very dry and dead. Um, so, and also when you kind of like know what happened uh, like before it's that there has been like kind of like an urban forest before then they took it down because there was an event like a like a federal garden show which was the, like a huge huge thing in this city and uh, a lot of like controversy and um yeah so so they actually like had to re like replant the trees that have been there beforehand so this is actually very very sad to see that like this effort didn't even really um, work out, but yeah, I know this is not today, so uh, for now we're going to be happy about the um, planting of trees. Um, yeah, on the next slide. Thanks. Um, yeah, then there's also what I mentioned yesterday that there's like the these old and um, like especially these planes that you can see on the or plane trees that you can see on the right hand side. Um, they are like this this like courtyard is called like the plane courtyard, so they are like a piece like. They belong to the image of the city and um yeah so they do have like high rates of tree survival and growth and specific um species that are like yeah that they just very much like we have a lot of like this chestnut type and yeah the plane trees and then other ones that are um yeah for example the hazel has been planted a lot throughout the whole city area um within like the last 15 years i would think um just to make it more resilient um yeah then there's um this one um area which i found really interesting which is kind of like an attempt to making tree spaces and in, in development and getting trees to grow there so they didn't actually um so this is a uh, also like an area that's going to be like like houses are going to be built there like single family houses or like where like multiple families can live so the picture in the upper left corner is what it looked like before so there was a lot of um sorry fields I, i'm sorry i'm like a little bit stuck on words and there were also a bunch of like fruit trees there um which they tried to kind of save so the the picture that i tried to capture it was a bit difficult to like walk around the like construction sites um so those are the like oldest trees at the side that you can see that they tried to keep there or like have those like wild green stripes there which is new like i live in this kind of like a redeveloped new area too and everything was taken down when we moved in and, tre and trees were planted back uh, like afterwards um and here they've been trying to save some of the trees but apparently when i talked to the to the guy from the city and um, who's responsible for the green spaces in general um this has not been very successful because taking down some of the like the yeah just kind of like decreasing the the space of the trees and taking down some of them just like destabilized the ones that are still there so now they have to make like a big effort and i think they are planning that within i don't know like like in the near future to make like a huge um like take action and replant those trees like take them out and put them somewhere else because they always have these like whenever they like seal the ground in some space they have to like have some kind of um like a alternative spot where they like either 
plant trees or move trees or at least have some spaces within the new area that are not sealed, which I know is like a huge index in the like sealed like impermeable surface or sealed surface. So um, yeah, if, this one is really interesting to like look at these plants and see it in action, which doesn't look as cool and um, impressive as it looks on the plan, I would think. Um, yeah, and then lastly, oh, sorry. Oh yeah, they should. Sorry, oh, yeah. I hit sorry. <laughs> There should be one more. I like double hit it, okay. <laughs> no worries, thanks. Um, yeah, that's just kind of what I said before anyway. Um, it's like the huge efforts are that like they are really big efforts being taken. And I think that's like in together with like getting citizens to plant new trees and adopt trees and all. Um, this is a huge effort that they're like trying to lengthen the lifespan of the already existing trees because they are really important to the city's image. And um, yeah, that's what I showed yesterday, like those monumental trees that are like really important and they like build a little fence around them and they um, I know I find it really interesting because I, I don't know how much like if they should leave some of the dead branches like you said for like birds to nest and everything but um, these are very very groomed the trees and like all the dead branches are, are cut off and um, there's a lot of like support kind of like poles to support the branches so yeah they're making like a huge effort to save these and there's like tree surgeons coming and um, they are either like hired by the city like city employees or they hired from like external contractors and they all work under the um like the 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 areas forest supervision kind of in that way so they all have kind of like one set of guidelines and yeah um yeah this is really important so those were the i don't know like the examples that i could find in my town for additions to canopy cover thanks thanks kate linton thank you very much uh Joanna. Uh, anyone have uh, questions or comments? I'm just going to, I just, it, it looks like, you know, no matter where you, across the country or in Germany or wherever, we're all trying to increase the canopy in very similar ways and we face similar challenges. Um, and, you know, the struggle is to uh, keep on uh, the the public and to, to gain the funding within the in the case of urban municipalities or whoever the political um, uh, funding agency I guess it's municipalities or whoever you know is to keep the awareness because you need funds to do this kind of um, maintenance like um, uh, whether it's uh, planting, which Amory here in Toronto has been incredibly successful in raising the awareness and getting funds. It's really about funding. So then when I see many of these other places, it's about protection. And, and so just gaining awareness in that, I, I wanted to, I'll, I'll stop saying the obvious here, but I was, I noticed in many people's talks, there's those, and I'm going to ask what people's impression on this, on how, I, how to preserve or increase the canopy is the watering bags at the bottom of the trees. How do people feel about those water bags? Just, you know, do you think that's going to gain the canopy or is it, is it in what way might it gain the canopy? It seems like an obvious question, but I'm kind of curious what people think about putting water bags on trees. Because I, as you can tell, I have my own opinion. Uh, we don't know that opinion yet, Sandy, from you, but uh, yes. I think it's highly dependent on the um, annual rainfall patterns and the summer drought patterns. So, you know, a caliper tree taken out of the nursery, bald and burlapped, that has probably lost 80% of its root mass uh, as it leaves the nursery. And so um, you can almost say you can't overwater a brand new tree in the in an urban setting. Um, and so our planting contractors who are uh, obliged to uh, warrant each tree for two growing seasons, and if it dies, then they have to plant a new one. They are taking their chances on not watering our trees. Um, and they'll, they'll just come and plant a new one if the tree dies for whatever reason. And it could well be because we had a six week drought or they planted the tree around now which is about the stupidest time of year next to January that you could actually plant a tree. So um, here we are in Halifax with 1500 millimeters of rain per year. This summer, not really having a drought. 
I don't blame them for not watering. Uh, the watering bags are not inexpensive. I've talked to uh, foresters in Europe, urban foresters, who say, oh yeah, we can afford that. Well, they're in rich cities. Um, uh, we've never tried watering bags here. I doubt we'd need them. But watering our newly planted trees a couple of times uh, to settle them in and give them a, a bit of a head start, I think is um, not, not doing it is a bad budgetary decision. There's my two cents. Excellent. Thank you. Are there water bags, the bags we saw in some of the- Yeah, the green bags at the yeah. base of the trees, okay. you'll see them a lot. They have a zipper in them. As you say, Peter, I forget what the price is, but they're not inexpensive. And yeah, why would uh, a, a region like the Atlantic want to invest in that when it, it's, um, it's obvious that, you know, that it's only a targeted points where they actually need it. I mean, I guess I was, I don't know what it is in Montreal nor Vancouver, but I see a lot of them here and the city does put them on street plantings as, because that's where the challenges are often. We saw Francoise and um, our, our team here in, in Toronto showed actually the irrigation. So they invested quite heavily in hooking up to the fire hydrants and running water a long ways away. Um, water is critical. When somebody asks me what's wrong with my tree, what can I do for my tree? All I say is water it. Like, you know, you, you can almost never water it too much. And no matter whether it's a pest problem or a disease or whatever. But so the thing is, what I find here in Toronto, these water bags, I think the public, to me, it lulls the public into a sense that the trees are being looked after. Um, especially in public land. And in fact, these water bags, I've never seen the city going around putting water in the water bag. Um, so I don't know if they do, uh, we could check that out. Uh, Amory's not here to tell me, but um, I think it's, it's almost false advertising at times. Um, and it's expensive, like it's not cheap. So <laughs> you're investing in it and it would be better to send a truck around if you could. Um, so I wonder, uh, that's why I threw it out there, because if they're filled with water, that's great, but usually they're not. And the water just, it, the water bag, the water runs out fairly quickly. So you don't, almost that's don't a, need a bag. Like I'm not even yeah, sure what the wind is. I would like to ask is. my students from Montreal, because actually I haven't been in Montreal very much in the last year or so, as you might imagine, but I've never seen them in Montreal. Well, they're in Toronto and I saw them in Germany and Vancouver. Weren't they in Vancouver? Didn't they? Yeah. I think Matt has just left the room and he's going to get a water bag. <laughs> no, he just oh, no, closed his AC. Just so he speaks, we'll hear him. All right. He could try to be quieter, I think. You, you got it exactly. I'm turning off the running air conditioner in the background. Um, I, yeah, they're, they're not as popular here as I think they are in Ontario. I'm not sure why. I have certainly seen them around on a few contractor sites, uh, but not to nearly the extent. I think Sandy touched on probably the big point uh, about them and that I have seen, you know, in the past, look, they've been around for a long time. Um, you have to put water in them and and they, they don't feel by themselves so they get installed as a specification um but the follow-up isn't there to actually fill them and some of them do drain out over a fairly long period of time the intent is that they reduce the requirement for that mulch mound so you can go dump some water in them and carry on fairly quickly with a with a high pressure hose so it's just uh it's only one watering and it's only for maybe one week's watering. So you still have to do it every week. And maybe it saves a little bit of time, but. I... I'm not sure. I wondered if someone from Toronto, because there was the comment, I think it was on our second site or when it may have been the first site where they put trees in and they have a two year guarantee. This is one of these standard, you know, whatever the contract states. Do you guys remember what that? that that was yeah. on our that was on our second site. So the, yeah. the two year warranty, things have to be alive by year two, but that doesn't mean they they didn't just replace it six months ago. Uh, so it, two year warranty doesn't mean like established. Um, I think I think that was on the second site. But I was I was really impressed with the irrigation system that they had put out 
from the fire hydrant. And I wondered, like that's the first time that I that I hear about using fire hydrants for this purpose. They are obviously paying the city for, for the water that they are using. Uh, and this is a setup that they deploy and then reuse at every site that they that they do, obviously. So it's a it's a moving, it's a it's sort of a moving equipment. Has anybody else in other cities uh, sort of leveraged the urban infrastructure like this just to give sort of plantations a head start in the beginning? Caitlin has mentioned in the chat uh, tree diapers um, that she was wondering if other people have heard them, but I don't. Is that what these are or they're different? Um, so I, I was working with a city for a few years outside of Chicago and they, the forester was also kind of having issues with like, um, they call them like gator bags, um, the ones that are um, against the trunk um, that you have to fill up. I forget how often you, you really have to fill those up, but he was looking into, um, I guess they're called tree diapers and you like plant them with the newly, like the new tree planting um, and it's kind of with the root system. And then I guess it like helps to absorb water and then it kind of biodegrades over the first few years and then kind of like is done. Um, so I didn't know if that's something that cities are actually like using or not, but. Is that like a slow release so that it, um, so you've got a diaper and the tree can actually pull it away from the diaper? Because I mean, that's basically what it has to do is sort of you know, the diaper has to release the water. <laughs> I can't yeah, I guess it retains water in some right. way, but it's I don't like really... biochar. That's the 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 argument for putting yeah. biochar into those sites that the biochar will slowly release water and let it go. That's assuming diapers release the water. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think I think that what Caitlin's talking about is a is a gel uh, yeah. material that gets added. And yeah, that's exactly what it is. It, it it retains water, releases it out over a period of time, and it can be mixed in with the soil. So it's wow. a soil additive. Right. Um, so it's it's not in a diaper. No, <laughs> it's no. Actually, yeah. but I think it might it's be in. the material that they use in diapers. Like I think that might be where it comes yeah. from. Yeah. 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 Which is just a, a cellulose, isn't it? A, I yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So. so. It's probably a wood product that you could convert the wood from urban trees that are being cut into gel. <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, yep. I know it's bedtime in Germany, and it's, <laughs> it's getting very close to bedtime in Halifax, or at least beer time. You, so, you're uh, done your beer? Uh, it's well, on the it's table, on the table there. We just wanted uh, Christian to know that uh, we're already in, the, in, the, in our cups, as it were. So... Uh, <laughs> It, I think it would be a good uh, opportunity to um, close down the day. I'll bring my face away from the post here so you can uh, see it a little bit. And um, uh, thank everybody for making their uh, presentations. And we've had some fascinating discussions. And tomorrow there'll be more because tomorrow it's all about um, deletions uh, from the canopy we try to increase. We're always trying to increase it, but we never have it stable. There's always ways for it to disappear. We are going to go uh, and look at uh, deep in, their, in, their, in the urban core, uh, what's happening with trees in the very busy streetscapes of commercial uh, territory here in Halifax for a change, because we were out at the periphery today. And I hope all the rest of you have a wonderful itinerary set up for for Wednesday. So I think we should um, call it quits for the day if everybody's uh, in agreement with that. And then uh, go on with our uh, wonderful evenings and we'll uh, see you tomorrow. Same time, same place, same channel.